Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all very much for coming along to our third event in our series of general election hustings, uh, where this week we're joined by uh, the prospective Labour MP for Bath, Ollie Middleton. Um, as you know, with reference to the structure of this evening, um, the candidate is firstly going to have five minutes um, for opening remarks. Um, then we're going to have around 20 minutes of pre-prepared questions uh, regarding student issues, which every, every candidate coming here will have to face. Then after that, we're going to open the floor to you, so you can ask questions on about anything you want. And the questions will come around two at a time. And once you've asked the question, um, please don't hold on to the mic. And also remember to wait for the mic before you actually ask the question. Um, we also encourage you to tweet in questions uh, with the hashtag Bath Decides, um, where the conversation does tend to get quite lively, to say the least. Um, this event, we hope it, um, we want it to kind of hope for a finish around half past eight. Um, so now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Ollie to give his opening remarks. Okay, well, thank you so much um, for inviting me along today. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully you guys will find it useful. I know I'm certainly going to find it useful um, hearing from you. You notice how high you all are. Now I know how my lecturers must feel. Um, <laughs> So, I'm fir first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself, um, how I became in uh, involved in politics, but most importantly, why I became involved in politics. And I've grown up in Bath. Bath's my home. I went to school just up the road um, at Ralph Allen, which some of you may know. And I first got involved in politics around two or three years ago. I'd always maintained an interest, but it, it wasn't until I was in sixth form, actually, that I took the step... Of, uh, of actually joining um, a political party. And that was largely down to what I was experiencing, what I was seeing um, at the time. And what I, what I was experiencing was an NHS under immense pressure, pushed to its limits, um, the continued erosion of the welfare state, the impacts of cuts um, upon our public services, on the lives of working people and on the vulnerable as well. And what I was seeing was a country that really only works for those at the top, and an economically incompetent government driven by ideological um, dogma. And this is the same government, of course, um, that is imposing the bedroom tax upon the, most, um, upon the poorest and vulnerable in society at a time when they're giving tax breaks um, to millionaires. So I was obviously feeling quite angry, quite frustrated, and in Labour, though, I really did see an alternative, a vehicle for positive change, um, a positive vision for the future, really importantly, based on social justice, a party based on equality, inclusivity, fairness, that has always stood for the many, um, rather than just the few, and a, a progressive party, everything that certainly the, the Conservative Party is not. But there's also another element to my involvement in politics and, and why I'm here tonight. And you may have noticed that I'm reasonably young. <laughs> I'm actually a student, like you guys, um, and two or three years ago, when I was feeling quite angry and frustrated, I, I was feeling like that as a member of society, but primarily as a young person. And young people have been hit so profoundly hard by this government. We've obviously seen the trebling of tuition fees after Lib Dems promised to scrap them and, and vote against any increase. We've seen EMA scrapped. Um, we've still got nearly one million young people unemployed, and obviously the cuts have had a far... Um, worse effect uh, upon the young. And for the first time since the Second World War, our generation is actually facing the prospect of being worse off than our parents, which is, which is really massive. But I believe there is a reason for this. There is an explanation. Um, we have a government who simply does not represent the interest of young people. We do have an issue with an underrepresentation of young people in politics. And as it stands, I believe as a, as a, a result of a lack of young people voting, we are seeing decisions taken at the expense of young people. And I don't believe, as it stands, young people have a sufficient um, political voice. And I actually believe that when we look at Parliament, we should see a cross-section of society. That has to include young people, because how else can we reach a common consensus and a, and a form of politics that works for everyone? Um, but I do believe things can change. But my belief is that we must engage with the system in order to change it. And history tells us that, you know, we, we've never achieved, no one's ever achieved anything by simply sitting back and doing nothing, whether it's those that fought for the right to vote in the first place, or those that fought for minimum wage, or, or those that fought for, for workers' rights. 
Um, now, I believe things can be better. I believe things can improve. But we need a government to ensure this happens. So if you do take a few clear messages away with you tonight, let them be this. On the 7th of May, vote for representation, firstly. Um, vote for a country that works for all once again, but vote for change. So there you go, I, and I, uh, I look forward to, uh, to your questions. Thank you very much, Ollie. Okay, so if we move on to our first question. Um, so, on a local and national level, how would you address high housing and transport costs that makes living in cities like Bath expensive? Um, well, there are two, two massive issues, two issues that I'm coming across all the time when we're out in Bath, when we're canvassing. I mean, first of all, the transport issue. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the transport problem in Bath. I mean, the two biggest issues that we're facing are a lack of affordability and a lack of efficiency. Now, both of those problems, to an extent, have to be tackled at a national level. And I'm really pleased, actually, the Labour Party is the only party offering a solution. We are saying that we're going to change legislation nationally to ensure that we apply a London authority um, system to cities like Bath. That will, first of all, give councils the power to control fares, which, which will hopefully mean that we, we see um, a reduction. Um, and it will also integrate transport to ensure that we have an effective system. So if you're getting a bus down from the Uni or from Oldfield, where I know a lot of you guys are probably living, and you're catching a train um, to Bristol at a certain time, if you get on that bus, we will ensure that that bus gets there in time for you to, to catch that train. Um, so the second issue is obviously housing. It's a really big one. I'm really pleased Labour is committed to building 200,000 new homes per year. Um, house building at the moment is at its lowest level since the 1920s. Um, to do that, we want to free up land locally in order to, to, to build houses. And we have a real problem with individuals sitting on land, waiting for that land to accumulate in value. So we're going to give councils the power to be able to kind of force sales through and build houses. But another element which is particularly key for students is the cost of renting. I think we've got to make renting far more affordable. So we're committed to, to banning unfair letting fees um, for a start. Um, so things like administration costs, on average, this will save about around £350 um, per person. We also want to cap annual increases, um, which is really important as well. And, and the next one is obviously particularly important for families, maybe for you guys further on the line. We want to make three-year tenancies um, standard. Um, but I'm also really pleased because tonight, actually, I'm able to announce... Um, <coughs> our campaign locally um, that we are, we, we are about to launch, um, which is called Head Leasing, and basically it involves um, trying to improve the st uh, standard of student accommodation. So at the moment, 80% of uh, multiple occupancy housing um, in the city, primarily occupied by students, 87% are seen as um, being below um, standard or inadequate. Um, so we want to try and raise standards by, um, by universities ultimately taking control of the management of properties. This has been done in other areas. It's worked really well. Um, it's also um, involved a reduction in cost because deposits have been cheaper and lower administration costs as well. So that's something we're going to be pushing locally. Um, and hopefully it's something we can push through because it will make a massive difference um, to you guys and future students as well and will help to improve um, the quality of housing in, in Bath. Thanks. Um, at this point, have we got any questions or comments from the audience regarding the um, uh, answer just given there? No? Uh, yep. Go on. Uh, we just have a break. We just wait so we can get the mic to you. Well, to, to an, I, I actually heard, so it should be right. To, 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 to an extent, um, it could be argued... Um, that you know, our, our policy is, a, is effectively a rent control. We are capping increases. Um, so not any increase at all, but a cap on, on annual increases. Um, but but long term, I think it's definitely something that we've got to continue to assess um, the viability of. OK, if we move on <laughs> to our next question. Um, now, with students looking to improve their chances in the job market, um, what are your policies to make sure students are well-equipped to face employment post-graduation? Um, 
Well, I mean, this is a, a particularly big issue in Bath. Um, we've got a real problem in Bath with, with graduate um, retention. So if I, I just focus on, on Bath for a second. In fact, I was involved with something called the, the City Identity Project two years ago, um, when I was still in sixth form, in fact. And, and we were basically um, identifying you know, where the city is going, some of the issues that the city is con um, currently facing, some of the barriers um, to progress. And one of the issues was graduate retention. And I think one of the biggest problems we're facing in Bath is the costs of living in, a cit in the city. Um, housing is, is massively ex expensive. We've got some of the highest um, rents here in the southwest. We've got some of the highest costs um, for, for, to buy a home in the country. Um, so as I said, you know, we, we want to build more homes, um, which will make a difference. Um, and we also want to obviously get rents down, um, which will make um, a difference too. We've also got to ensure that local businesses are creating jobs, are in a position to continue to create jobs. So um, one of the, the policies that, that we're um, putting forward that will hopefully um, sustain growth and ensure job creation is, is a freeze on business rates and cutting business rates um, too. Um, but the cost of living, obviously, is a, is a massive problem, and it's a massive problem nationally, affecting people in Bath. We want to get the cost of living down. Um, we're committed to reinstalling the 10p starting rate of tax, which will effectively be act as a, a tax cut for 24 um, million working people. And a lot of you may know about our energy price freeze um, policy. And just to be clear, um, obviously prices are falling now, which is fantastic. I think it was actually a result of... Um, of, of, of Labour really setting the agenda on that particular issue, but it won't be a freeze on, on reductions, it will be a freeze on, on any increases. So I think that's, that's really important as well. Okay. Um, are there any questions from that? Yeah. Can we wait for the microphone for a moment? Uh, thanks. Um, right, so you mentioned earlier that you would want to uh, allow councils to force sales on land. I'm wondering how you would go about this. So you, you basically have to change the legislation at national level, um, because at the moment there's lots of barriers to councils doing that. Effectively, if you've got someone in Bath, for example, that is sitting on um, brownfield sites, waiting for them to accumulate in value, um, sites that otherwise could be used for, for, for building housing, Councils are powerless. We want to change that by changing legislation nationally and allow councils to, to force free sales. Um, that, that kind of exists already um, in the case of, I know, if, 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 a, if a local authority or the government nationally wants to build a road in a certain area, there is already existing legislation which basically involves um, land being, um, being, being uh, sold off and, and kind of forcing free sales. So. Okay, uh, we've got a question through Twitter, um, which is, why should we trust universities to manage quality landlords when they are the ones stealing disproportionate fees? Well, I, I think... Quite an ironic <laughs> question. I, I think it's, um, it's a good point, but I, I think, obviously, the, the university, um, every university in the country has a responsibility towards its students. And the point is that, um, as a result of low-standard property, um, I, I know, having spoken... And, and I, I often do speak to a lot of um, residents in the areas where students are living. It's obviously a problem for local residents as well. Ultimately, that causes problems um, for the universities. So it is in the university's interests um, to take over the management of properties. It will, will help them in the long run. Perfect. Um, we can move on to our next question. Yep. Um, graduate opportunities are increasingly um, in London. So if most students leaving, uh, as a result, most students leaving um, university cities like Bath, so how would you increase the quality and quantity of graduate jobs throughout the UK? Not just in London. So, so I mean, as I said, um, you know, it's about giving businesses, um, you know, the, the greatest possible opportunity um, to grow, because growth, of course, leads to, to job creation, um, which is really important. And at the moment... Um, Growth is, the economy is obviously growing. Um, we we want to get the economy growing um, more. We want to be creating more jobs. Um, and one of the most effective ways to do that is ensure that people um, have got money to spend. So as I said, we're going to obviously, um, we, we're going to reinstall the 10p starting rate of tax, which will ensure that people have far more money to spend in order um, to tackle the cost of living. We're going to raise the minimum wage to £8 an hour. Um, which is really important as well and continue to, um, to push 
a living wage. So hopefully that will lead um, to more job, job opportunities, but also kind of greater quality um, of jobs as well. Do any members of the audience have any questions? Wait for the mic. <laughs> Um, you said uh, like pe businesses need to have money to create jobs, but surely raising the minimum wage will just mean less jobs being able to be created by businesses. We're going to take money out of the poorest people's pockets in an attempt to make them better off. Well, this will be um, an increase. It, it, won't, it won't happen straight away. This will be a gradual increase um, between 2015 and 2020. Um, but studies have shown that actually increasing the minimum wage has a positive effect on local economies as a result of obviously people having more money to spend, that's more money in the pockets um, of local people, that's more money in the pockets of local businesses. So, Perfect. Um, we've actually got one question here which I think referred to something that you said earlier. So, if the Conservatives are the party of the few, um, why have they gained such large popular support? <coughs> uh, well, I dispute whether they gained large um, po popular um, Support. I mean, they failed to secure a majority at the last election. Um, this is largely down to the fact that Conservatives um, can't win in the North. Um, this is really a result of, of Thatcher's legacy. I, I don't believe um, the Tories will be able to secure a majority again until they are able to, to, to win the North. Um, so, you know, I, I'd certainly um, dispute that. Okay. Now, if we move on to our last uh, pre-prepared question, um, which kind of involves um, student engagement. So students, as we know, in this constituency um, are a huge portion. So although turnout does remain low, locally and nationally. So my question is, how would you re-engage young people in politics? So obviously this is a, a, an issue I find myself talking about quite a lot. Um, so almost on a, on a daily basis, um, as a result of at my age, um, largely. But, but it, it, it's clear that, um, that obviously... Um, a lot of young people are disillusioned by politics. I always challenge the term apathy. I don't believe that young people are apathetic because I think when you ask them about political issues, when you ask them about their, their opinions on political issues, often their opinions are far stronger than, than, than those of, of adults. Um, but I, I think largely what's being lost is, is the connection between young people feeling strongly about certain issues and, and seeing um, political parties as a, as a vehicle for change, and that's the connection that we've got to really try and, and re-establish. I think lack of trust is a problem. Consistently, when surveys are done, um, trying to establish the root causes behind um, disillusionment, lack of trust is, is massive. I actually think, interestingly, um, the referendum in, in Scotland really highlighted this. Um, we saw a really um, high turnout, particularly um, a high turnout of young people. And I think largely that the, the reason behind that was the fact that the vote was, was legally binding. It was simple or yes or no. Um, because I know a lot of people looked at Scotland afterwards and thought, oh, great, you know, we've got all these young people turning out. Apathy isn't a problem after all. I, I don't think that's the case. Um, I think there's obviously a lot of misconceptions out there. I, I think a lot of people that are disillusioned, when you ask them why, the classic one, it's something I come across all the time. Politicians are all in it for themselves. They're all the same. I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot, of, a lot of MPs out there that work incredibly hard. In fact, the majority of them work really hard. In fact, really interestingly, um, Russell Brand is obviously a, a classic example of someone that does tarnish um, politicians with one brush. I mean, he was shown a list of some of the stuff that his local Labour MP had been doing in, in his constituency, and she was fighting for the same things that he was was fighting for, and he just didn't, he just didn't realise, because I think he was really kind of blinded by, by, um, by anger. So we've really got to try and challenge um, those misconceptions. I think a lot of people do feel politics isn't representative. I think we've got to ensure that, that Parliament um, is as representative as possible, is a cross-section of society, like I was saying, to make sure we, are, we do achieve um, diversity of decision-making. But in, 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 terms of, in terms of solutions, I think we've really got to try and engage young people from as early on as possible. That means in school. And I'm really pleased the Labour Party has committed to, to vote at 16. I think it's fantastic. It will help um, to engage young people as early on. I'm also a passionate advocate and supporter of political education in schools. Um, I think, uh, I think 
uh, political education should be part of the curriculum. I think that that's really important um, because I think you know when when I certainly when I speak to a lot of a lot of people, not necessarily young people but older people as well, they say, well, you know, I, I don't understand politics. Um, often when you actually talk to them, um, you know, you, you find that that's maybe not the case, or certainly not to the extent that they were making out. But a lot of people do have that problem. Um, but as I said, you know, again, we, we, we've got to try and really make um, Parliament a, as representative as possible. I think that will again go a long way um, to restoring trust. I think a lot of people do look at Parliament, and the reality is they, they see a lot of people that, that certainly don't look like them, and often they, they think that as a result they may not think um, they may not think like them either. So that's certainly something that we've really got to got to try and address as well. Perfect. Um, do any members of the audience, yeah, on the right hand side here, and then afterwards up, up there. Um, so you talk about Parliament being more representative. Um, would you support a change in the voting system to help maybe um, improve that representation? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I presume you're probably talking about proportional representation. And I mean, it, it, it's something I think we've, we've got to continue to assess the viability of proportional representation. I mean, I am sceptical of elements of it. Um, I, I know that it, it can lead to um, quite stagnated um, forms of government, which can be problematic. I mean, ultimately, you want um, political parties in power to create positive change that will affect you know, your lives and the lives of people up and down the country. It, it does become harder to do that. I think the last five years have, has really proven that coalitions are, are not a success. I mean, I don't think this necessarily works in the way that coalitions should, because the Lib Dems um, really um, have simply propped up a Tory um, government. Um, I think there are also risks with regards to there's less transparency. It kind of leads to deals being done kind of under the table, behind closed doors, which is a worry as well. But I, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm not against proportional representation. I think there are still, but there are still um, a few elements of it I'm, I'm slightly sceptical of. But it's something that we, we should continue to assess, definitely. Um, hi, uh, you talk about... Uh, where, where are you? I'm hello. Sure. <laughs> hi. There you are. <laughs> yeah, uh, you talk about politicians being in it for themselves, putting off young people. Um, do you think career politicians put young people off voting? Um, I, know for, I know for some people, um, career politicians are a problem. People have only worked in, uh, in, in, in politics. But I actually think we should be assessing our, our politicians primarily on the basis of, of life experience. I don't think life experience should be simply defined by having worked, um, uh, having done a certain job for a certain period of time or having paid a mortgage. Whilst those are very relevant experiences, they shouldn't be the be-all and end-all. So I think we need to be ensuring that we, we, you know, we, we're getting people in Parliament that are representative, you know, have got relevant life experiences um, and, and bring something new to the table. Because, of course, everyone brings something new to the table, which is really important as well. Okay. Um, now we're going to open up to the floor. So... Um, here we're going to um, take questions on um, a wide range of topics. Anything you want to ask a question on, uh, more than welcome to. So if anyone's got a question, uh, please raise your hands. We'll get the mic to you. Okay, first we'll take you um, over there in the white T-shirt, and then we'll come to the lady here on the, in the turquoise. Um, you just talked about lack of representation in politics. Do you also think that actually there's a lack of representation and diversity in higher education as well? And do you think that's something that needs to be addressed? Do you mean the, the leadership of, of higher education? or um, I mean, uh, students within higher education and access to higher education. Yeah. Um, I think to an extent, I mean, when the, when the last Labour government um, came into power in, in, in 1997, something that pushed right to the, the top of the agenda was, was higher education. And, and back in 1997, um, there was a real problem in the, in the, in the case that not every young person did have an opportunity to go to university. I, I think to a large extent we've overcome that problem. I think virtually every single um, young person in the country now has an opportunity to go to university, which is brilliant. And, and I think certainly um, in the case of a lot of universities, they are far more diverse than they ever were, um, which I think is, is fantastic as well. And we've got to make sure that we continue and sustain that. I think it's vital. And then over here. Hi. Um, how do you attempt to address like mental <coughs> health issues? Um, because obviously in the recent government there's been a lot of cuts in that area, yeah. and it's been quite damaging. So um, mental health is is a, it's, it's a big part of our, our, our plans for the NHS. Um, obviously that the cuts have had a, have, a de have had a devastating effect on our health service. Um, the mental health budget has been cut. We want to increase the mental health. 
um, budget, which is, is really important. But we also want to emphasise the importance um, of focus, particularly on young people. I mean, studies have consistently shown that the, the earlier on you tackle mental health issues, the less likely it is that those issues will arise um, later on in life. So that's something we've, we put a lot of emphasis on too. We want every single um, teacher in the country to have some kind of mental health training. Um, <laughs> um, which I think will, will certainly help to address uh, mental health issues and young people allow teachers to spot mental health issues earlier on and also allow them to, to deal with mental health issues. Um, we also want nurses to have um, experience in, in, in mental health training too. Um, which is also really important. But, I mean, as you said, it's a big issue, and unfortunately, um, cases of, of mental health issues are, are increasing, so it's a problem we've got to try and overcome. Okay, um, back to questions from the floor. Who's got a um, man at the front here, and then um, at the front here, the third row? Hi there. On the top of immigration, so uh, when uh, Theresa May came into power, she introduced a minimum income for... Uh, British citizens to have before they can bring their spouses from abroad. So this is actually above the minimum wage and it's above the living wage as well. So British citizens who actually have children yeah. are having to have either, they either, either have to move abroad or they're, tam they're having to decide which parent their child should be mm. growing up with because yeah. they're only on minimum wage or, or, or living wage. Yeah, I, I'm aware of the situation. In fact, I was out um, on, on Sunday in Bath and I actually came across and knocked on someone's door and the guy um, had experienced this very problem and I had an opportunity to talk to his son, actually. Um, and, you know, his dad said, the dad said to his son, you know, how, how did it feel to be without your mum for a year? And he said, it, you know, it was really scary. And this is kind of the reality of the changes in the law that we've seen. And it's really sad. Um, so... Um, We've said that we're committed to certainly reassessing the law. At the moment, it's not working. Um, it, it seems to be discriminating um, against individuals who want to come and work here and contribute. Um, so I, I certainly think it's, it's highly likely that there will be a change in the law. And now over here. Uh, nice to meet you, Ollie. Good um, to meet you, too. Originally, um, I come from Cardiff in, in South Wales, and there, South Wales, and there has been um, a row on the NHS there, which is also led by Labour. Um, what improvements could you do for the um, NHS here in England? And could it be better than, than yeah. in Wales? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, it's important to point out with the, the Welsh NHS. I think the, the, Welsh, the Welsh NHS has been used by a scapegoat consistently um, by the Tory government. The, the, Welsh, the NHS in Wales actually promoted, improved dramatically. Um, under, under Labour leadership. And, of course, we've got to remember that, that the, the budget is still ultimately um, controlled um, by central government. Um, the Welsh budget has also been, been cut, of course. Um, well, we're committed to, one, um, revoking the Health and, and Social Care Act, which was an incredibly damaging piece of legislation. I mean, a lot of you may have, may have heard of it. It basically opened the door um, to limitless... Um, privatisation of the NHS and um, since the Health and Social Care Act was passed in 2012 um, by this government, it was backed by the Lib Dems as well, um, I think something like two thirds um, of NHS contracts have gone to private companies. Um, you know, I personally believe that, that um, I believe in a, in a public NHS um, fundamentally, I believe by, by doing this, by public companies coming in and running NHS contracts, we are undermining the very values that our NHS is, was founded upon. So first of all, we're, we're going to revoke the Health and Social Care Act, which is going to be, going to be vital. Um, we're also committed to investing £2.5 billion a year. This will mean that we'll, able to, we'll be able to um, increase the number of frontline staff, who of course been cut, so that's 20,000 extra nurses, 8,000 more GPs, um, 5,000 more care workers and 3,000 more midwives. And uh, a big part of our, our plan as well is integrating health and social care, which will also lead to a more efficient system. It um, will lead, lead to savings and um, will essentially complete um, the initial vision for the NHS put forward by, by Nye Bevan, um, which um, involves the, the integration of whole person care, which is really important. Okay, um, any further questions from the floor? Okay, so we'll go um, at the top there in the red and black and white striped, um, and then we'll come here in the green shirt afterwards. 
Thanks, Ollie. Um, my question is just more towards Labour as just general macroeconomic policies. So whether you agree with it or not, the Conservatives have a clear plan to sort of austerity plan to cut, to cut more, to end the deficit. Um, but Labour sort of hasn't had the courage of its convictions. It's, Ed Balls has signed up to this, like, still. Um, and so, so there will be further cuts and tax rises in the next parliament. So my question to you is just, as traditional left wing, why doesn't Labour sign up to sort of more Keynesian economics and invest in society to get growth? Um, you, you won't be able to beat the Conservatives by following this line. Um, the Institute of Fiscal Studies has actually concluded that in terms of um, fiscal policy, there, there's never been um, a greater gap between the two parties, which I think is particularly poignant because often you know you hear that the parties are all the same. I really don't think they're all the same, but there's a massive difference between the level of cuts being put forward by the Conservative Party and, and the cuts being, being put forward um, by, by Labour, in fact, £45 billion pounds worth of difference. Um, the Tories want to take us back to the 1930s in, in terms of government expenditure. I really do believe that this has nothing, essentially, to do with, with economics. It has nothing to do with getting the deficit down. It is purely ideological. Um, when the Tories first came into power in 2010, they inherited a growing economy. The economy was recovering. It was a recovery for all importantly, they threw us back into recession, they lost our AAA credit rating, all in the name of the deficit. And quite frankly, they, they've written themselves this economic fairy tale about how David Cameron, the Conservatives, propped up by the Liberal Democrats, have come along and saved the economy. Well, they actually endorsed Labour's spending plans a few months um, before the general election. In fact, in between, um, before the last general election, um, at certain points, they actually um, pledged, pledged to match um, Labour's spending plans. Um, so, you know, there, there has never been um, a greater gap between the two parties. Obviously, we do have a deficit. We've got to get that deficit down. But there are other ways to do it, and that's importantly what we realise. You know, we, we want to, I mean, one of the biggest problems that this government has had to overcome is the fact that tax receipts are massively down um, because people simply have not got money in their pockets. 60% um, of people... Um, on the, who are welfare recipients are actually in work but cannot physically earn enough to sustain themselves. We're also having to subsidise um, low pay, which has led to an increase in social security spending. And borrowing has actually increased. That's the absurdity of it. Borrowing has gone up. And the debt, the national debt, has actually gone up. The deficit is, is halved as a proportion of, of GDP, which is slightly tenuous. But the national debt has actually, actually gone up. So... Um, it's a good point, but there, there has honestly never been, been um, more on the line because there's never been um, you know, more between the, between the two parties in terms of economic plan put forward. Gentleman here at the front. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, so you've spoken quite a lot about um, voter disengagement. Um, now, one of the reasons why it seems to me, for example, that um, a lot of people are disengaged in politics at the moment is because they don't really see much difference between certainly the three major parties, the Labour, Lib Dems and, and the Conservatives. Um, so, could you highlight very briefly exactly how Labour is different? Because an awful lot of the policies that are being put forward at a national level, for example, if you look closely at the differences between the three major parties, come down to not very much at all. Mm. Well, it's kind of back to the, the last question. I mean, as I've said, that there's never been more between the, the two parties. I mean, you're talking £45 billion pounds difference in terms of cuts, you know. I, I, I kind of anyone that argues that isn't much of a difference, I'm afraid I've got to disagree with, not that you necessarily are, but, but that is the difference we're talking about. It's the difference between taking us back to the 1930s and the difference between, you know, sustaining the, the social provisions that we're very lucky to have in this country, like the NHS, like the welfare state. Of course, we're going to increase funding in the NHS. That's, that's not something that the Tories have committed to. We're committed to increase the minimum wage to £8, which is really important as well. We're going to reinstall the 50% tax rate to ensure that those at the top are paying their fair share, um, which at the moment they're not. You know, we've seen a tax cut for millionaires, so we want to reinstall that 50% that tax rate and also reinstall the 10% the tax rate as well. So, you know, there are a few examples there. That There are plenty of examples um, in, in fact, I mean, also, I mean, another example, of course, is on, on the EU. Um, I mean, we're, we're not committed to offering a referendum on our membership of, of, of the EU um, because we, we're not going to pander to UKIP because, you know, we're very lucky to be a member of the European Union. We've got a lot to thank the European Union for, and we, we're not going to put um, the interests of, of Britain at, at risk by offering a referendum and, and, you know, the level of uncertainty that, that comes with that. 
Okay, um, I want to take a couple of questions from Twitter quickly. Um, so, if we firstly um, take on current, continuing on the theme of the economy, um, we've got a question here. Um, so, when Labour left power in 2010, they left a broken economy. Why should they be? Why should we? Be, uh, they be trusted to be allowed back in again? And then we've got another question. Um, do you Labour have any plans to increase maintenance loans for students? So, if you want to tackle the first one, then. To the second. Okay. Um, of course, I completely disagree with that, and I'm going to have to go back to some of my previous points. The economy was growing. The idea that the Tories inherited this broken economy on its knees is a complete falsity. And yes, you know, we had to deal with the realities of a global financial crisis. But you know, let, let's just let's just take a step back and look at the absurdity of the argument being put forward by the Tories. The idea that a single political party, a single government was responsible for a financial crisis that has decimated Asian economies, decimated a large number of South American economies, decimated the Eurozone. I mean, Greece is a perfect example. The US is only just recovering. It's so ridiculous, it's not even funny. Um, so, you know, it's... <laughs> I mean, when you, when, you, when you look at the argument, it really is completely and, quite frankly, absurd. Um, so I completely disagree. Um, with that point. And as I said, you know, the Tories actually endorsed Labour's spending plans not that long before the last election. Um, and we are committed to, um, is it, was it grants that were mentioned? Uh, yes, maintenance, maintenance grants. We are, are committed to increasing um, maintenance grants, I think, by, by £450. Um, this obviously is in line with our, um, with our, uh, our uh, decrease in tuition fees. We're going to cut tuition fees to £6,000, which will benefit everyone in this room, um, because those, that cut in fees will come in um, the moment um, we, we enter government, if there is to be, be a Labour government. OK. If we go back to the floor, so any questions? OK, can we have the girl uh, right at the back there with the earrings, and then um, we go in the blue T-shirt. Uh, <coughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to ask what Labour's policy is in, in, in trying to get more women into STEM subjects in universities. Um, well, I mean, again, you know, going back to the, the point that I made earlier, I, I think, um, I mean, I don't know what the exact figures are. Do you know what the figures are at this point in terms of the number of women studying STEM subjects? No, it's, it's quite low. Yeah. I think the main, the main thing we've got to do is, you know, increase accessibility as much as possible. Give every person in the country, including every um, woman in the country, an opportunity to go to university and study the subject of, of their choice. And that's something we're, we're committed to. Um, you know, I, I know that often the Lib Dems, um, particularly, because um, obviously it was, it was them that essentially voted to, to travel fees, um, talking about the fact that we've got more people going to university um, than ever, but actually, um, I know that a lot of people are incredibly put off by the prospect of leaving university with an average of over £40,000 worth of debt. So obviously, you know, part of the idea of reducing tuition fees and to ensure that, that there's no longer kind of such a barrier, uh, and certainly reducing the, 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 the level of fear when applying to university. And then the gentleman um, in the blue, just up there. <coughs> Sort of following on from that, um, do Labour have any plans to reverse the draconian changes that the... the will Labour put an end to <coughs> the Conservatives' um, draconian anti-international student agenda, which is potentially costing us um, billions of pounds in exports and is inhuman to boot, frankly? Um, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, what happened was at the beginning of the last, um, last parliament, David Cameron personally, um, during a radio interv interview actually, set himself um, these completely unrealistic immigration targets. Um, and it, it was a bit of a, 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 um, an easy way out as far as the government was concerned. The easiest way to get immigration down, it's actually gone up anyway, but the easiest way to get immigration down was to, to cut the number of international students. Obviously, it had a, a terrible effect on, on universities. Um, it, it's had an effect on local economies. Of course, international students come here. They spend their money. Um, it's really good. Obviously, universities have got more money. It creates jobs. Um, you're completely right. International students bring 
an, a, a very large number of benefits. So, you know, we, we've, we've got to make sure that we are getting the number of international students back up again, I think. Okay. Um, we had a question down here, I believe, and then we'll go um, up there in the blue T-shirt after that. Um, so, a lot of people have heard, rightly or wrongly, that, that Labour are running you merely as a paper candidate stand up against the Tories. Can I ask if there's any truth to that, and if there is, why you wouldn't stand down and endorse, say, a Lib Dem or Green anti-Tory candidate, because your combined votes might actually stop them taking bath? <laughs> Strange question. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a lot of different elements to that question. Um, Completely untrue. Um, I went through a, a, um, a democratic selection process. Every single party has a selection process. Um, every single party selection process is slightly different. Ours involves um, application. Candidates apply for um, to, to be parliamentary candidate. Candidates are then, then shortlisted. Sometimes selections are uncontested. Sometimes there's no need to shortlist. We shortlisted three. I was up against two other, other very experienced um, candidates. One of them was a, a professor of international law, in fact. Um, I ended up winning the vote on the day, which was, which was fantastic. Um, the idea always was, uh, I, I was never prepared to be a, a, a paper candidate. There was never ever, any, any, ever a suggestion that the Labour candidate would be a paper candidate, um, quite frankly, because we, we, are, you know, we, we are in it to win it. Um, I, I'm sure you, you, you know about um, the collapse of Lib Dem vote. Um, the collapse of Lib Dem, Dem vote across the country has been dramatic. That's certainly very clear here in Bath. The national trend suggests the vast majority of ex-Lib Dem voters are turning to Labour. That's something um, that, again, is very clear here. We're canvassing on a daily basis. We're talking um, you know, to, to, to hundreds of people a day. And the vast majority of, of them, or certainly a lot of them, are saying they're never going to vote Lib Dem again. And, and we've, been very, um, we've been very encouraged by the level of support we're getting. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very confident for the months ahead. Um, I, th I think the idea that I would, I would endorse a Liberal Democrat candidate is also, quite frankly, um, absurd. Um, because there's, there, as far as I see it, there is, is virtually no difference um, between the Liberal Democrats on the, and the Tories, um, certainly on the basis of the last five years. Um, the Liberal Democrats have propped up one of the most right-wing governments in history. I think it's fantastic that they're, they're being held to account um, because it is fully deserved um, on the basis of the tuition fees pledge alone. Um, so, and they've already made it clear that they'd be perfectly prepared to prop up the Tories again for another five years. I think it's quite unlikely that they'd, be, they'd hold the balance of power anyway. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Before we come to the gentleman at the top, I just want to ask a Twitter question that sort of links in. Um, so as a full-time student in London, how much time um, would you be able to dedicate to your duties as an MP for Bath, if elected? Well, I mean, at the moment, um, I'm, I'm quite lucky because the way that my, my university year has worked out has meant that I'm spending virtually every single hour of the day here in Bath um, campaigning. Um, I mean, it would, it would have to be... I, I, I'm, I, all I'm thinking about at the moment is the election in May and the result on the, on the 7th of May, um, or the 8th of May, in fact. Um, you know, what, what happens along the line, I'm not so sure. I think it is largely a case of I'll cross that bridge when I, when I come to it. <coughs> Another gentleman up the top. Um, hi, up here. There you are. Um, where do you stand personally and more generally uh, Labour stand with regards to academies and free schools? Really good question. Um, I was actually at a, um, a, a, the local uh, NUT AGM the other night. I was aware of some of the, the devastating impacts that Gove's reforms have had um, upon... Um, upon the teaching profession, upon schools, upon the day-to-day -day running of schools. But I mean, to be honest, um, the impact for the teachers personally um, really has been on, on, a, on a whole new level and, and, and the impact has been far more severe than, than I actually anticipated. I'm really pleased um, that Labour is committed to, to putting a, an end to free schools um, because free schools have been incredibly um, damaging to the education system. There's massive questions with regards to accountability. There's some real horror stories out there. Um, you've only got to, only got to um, go online and, and, and Google some of them. Um, there's issues with transparency as well. It leads to a completely fragmented um, education system. But, you know, the absurdity of it is 
um, that in certain areas we've, got, we've had millions of pounds of central government money being put into free schools that aren't needed. In fact, in Bath, that there, are, there are examples here of free schools that have been built that are not needed. We have a surplus of secondary school places here. Um, and that, that, um, that, that has come at the expense of other local schools, schools that are really struggling, struggling have seen their budgets cut. Um, so I'm really pleased that we're committed to putting an end to, to free schools. Okay. Um, so we have the gentleman here in the red um, jumper, and then we'll have the lady here in the back one. Hi, yeah. um, it kind of leads on from the question from this gentleman from earlier. Um, but from earlier you were saying how you felt that MPs needed the relevant life experience for such a role. Um, so really I was just wondering what your relevant life experience is that makes you the ideal candidate for Bath. Well, I mean, first and foremost, I've, I've grown up in this city. I'm, I'm the only candidate out of the, the three main parties um, to be able to say I've grown up in the city. I think that's a, that's a real asset. I think particularly, you know, I find all the time obviously talking to people about local issues, issues that are affecting them um, in Bath. And a lot of the time I've had experience myself, which, which makes it far more easy um, for me to, to relate to those people and, and, and hopefully tackle those issues. So I think, first of all, that's really important. Um, but as I say, in terms of my wider life experience, I do believe um, everyone brings something else to the table. Um, I, I have worked previously. I've, I've held down jobs. But, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a low-income family in Bath. I was brought up by, um, by, my, by my mother. So, you know, I, I, I think that those type of life experiences are certainly um, relevant as well and really Im important. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly question, you know, the idea that, that, that everyone sat in Parliament at the moment is, you know, we, we, have, we have people certainly on the um, on certain sides of, of, of Parliament at the moment who, you know, um, yes, they may be older, yes, they may have, have, have worked longer, but, of course, you know, um, there's people, that, there's an issue with, you know, with, particularly with the Conservative Party, with a large number of their MPs coming from the same backgrounds, there isn't that diversity of life experience, and I think that, that's kind of the type of thing that we've got to challenge. And the lady here at the front. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, based around the fact that there's been a lot of media coverage about sort of lack of confidence in Ed Miliband as a leader, what you think about that? Like, do you trust him if he were to win? 100%. Ed is, Ed, Ed, Ed is, his, his wife actually gave a, a brilliant but rare interview the other day, Justine Miliband, um, and, and, and she was actually saying, I mean, you know, obviously, to put yourself in her position, she's the one that's obviously having to see her her husband um, experienced some of these, these, these attacks from the right-wing media. I mean, that's obviously quite difficult, but she says she kind of hit the nail on the head, I think, because she explained it as it being something bigger than just about, about Ed and, 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 you know, his credentials and Ed being the, the next prime minister. It's about how we, we value politics in this country, how we see our politicians. You know, are we seriously, do we seriously value um, you know, the, the, do, do, we, do we see the, the, the kind of the way that someone eats a bacon sandwich or, or some of, of someone that, that maybe has a dodgy photo taken of them above, you know, integrity, decency, honesty, all the virtues I believe Ed possesses in abundance and has consistently um, shown throughout his time as leader. You know, he stood up to the en energy companies. He stood up to Rupert Murdoch. Um, over, over phone hacking. He's, he's stood up um, to big business and vested interests over tax avoidance. I think that's the type of man we need as Prime Minister. So I'm fully behind Ed. I think he's, been a, he's done a brilliant job as leader and he's been an even better Prime Minister. Does so anyone in the audience have any follow-ups to that? If not, yeah, we'll go to the, the white T-shirt on the end of the row. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, you clearly support him. Um, you're giving a passionate response to that. But the general public, they really don't like him. I think his approval ratings are still lower than Nick Clegg's, who's already like as unpopular as mud. Um, <laughs> so how on earth is he going to get the support of the country? He may get the support well, of his I own think, I think when you look public. at the, I, I think it's important not to get too bogged down with polls, but I think when you look at the polls that really matter, um, for a long time, Ed consistently, I mean, if you go back kind of, <clears throat> two or three years ago, I mean, I, I, we were maintaining leads of, of 10, 11 percent in the polls. Since Christmas, we, we've still um, been ahead in a large number of polls. Um, certainly, a lot of the, the localised polling that's been done in, in, in marginals. We are roughly on course for that majority. I think we can get it, and, and that's what really counts, to be honest. 
take a couple of questions from Twitter. Firstly, um, we've got, um, given that no one under the age of 58 has had a vote on EU membership for democracy, don't we deserve one? I, we're obviously, we, we are not supporting the idea um, of, a, of a referendum. Um, and the, the issue is, obviously, um, in calling for a referendum, in support of a referendum, the Conservatives have ignored all the advice from business leaders across the UK. There have been countless um, CEOs, chief executives of companies that operate from the UK that have said, if Britain leaves the EU, we will pull out. There will be no reason for us to locate in Britain and certainly um, no longer have access um, to the Europe, European market and the, the, um, the free market. Um, so, you know, we as a party are not prepared to ignore the advice from those business leaders. We are not prepared to put jobs at risk. And I think that that's really um, what counts. Okay, back to the floor. Um, we go to the gentleman here in the check shirt. And then to the man here in the hoodie after that. Over there. Uh, right, so going back to the economy again, sorry for that, but I'm slightly disappointed to see how you attributed the recovery in 2010 just to Labour's unsustainable fiscal stimulus rather than like meaningful growth. And then again, you attribute this sort of slowdown to rather than the Eurozone crisis, but merely down to party politics. And Ed Bull's been proven so wrong now in the past in literally every single economic prediction he had. Could you clarify again how you really think Labour are possible, like how they can possibly earn our trust again that they are competent with our economy? I, I mean, I, I feel very much I've, I've, I've answered that question. I think a lot of the, the reasons behind um, any existing lack of trust is, is, is a result of the misconceptions out there. I mean, Ed Bull said, um, as a result of the austerity policies on offer from the Conservative Party initially, the austerity policies have done, done untold damage to the country and to society, to the economy. Um, they, they, the, the austerity is estimated to have wiped 5% from our GDP, which is massive. That's something that, that George Osborne was consistently warned of. He ignored all those warnings. And, you know, it, economies recover. Um, it was put perfectly by, by Alan Johnson. I mean, Alan Johnson um, said, you know, even if there had been a sack of spuds um, sat in Whitehall for the past four years, we would have had some growth. I believe the economy um, has grown in spite of the, the economic policies of this government, not because of the economic policies of this government. And then here at the front. Um, what are your views on the uh, single transfer voting system for MPs? The what, sorry? Single transfer vote system. I'm, I'm not aware of what's the, the single transfer voting system. The single transfer voting system. Um, it's, uh, it's different from first past the post. The idea is that when you're voting, you rank candidates. You, you, um, you put down your favoured candidate with number one and secondary candidate with number two. And if I, mean, you were I, I think we've already kind of had a question on PR. I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to want to kind of give you an answer um, without without being in possession of the facts. So I'll, I'll have a look into it and uh, I'll maybe even get back to you. Um, if we have a question from the floor again. So you've got um, up there in the brown jacket um, at the end of the row and then back down here in the red T-shirt after that. Hi, yeah. Um, Hi there. Why, why does Labour seem not to trust the public with uh, the European Union? Surely if, uh, <laughs> sure, surely if you think that the public are, you know, do you think we, we're stupid that we're not going to make the right decision on Europe? Uh, you say about big businesses um, being on the side of staying in the well, EU. Well, small and medium-sized businesses as well. Okay, then um, surely people that are affected by that, why not give us the chance to have our say on it? Um, because, because, quite frankly, um, the risks, as I have said, that come with offering a referendum are massive. You know, that level of uncertainty at a time when we're, we're recovering from a, a global financial crisis is incredibly damaging. And we haven't completely ruled out a referendum. We've said if there is a, a greater transfer of powers or a, a proposition for a greater transfer of powers from the UK um, to Brussels, in that situation, we would offer a referendum. But there are a lot of misconceptions out there as well. I mean, Nigel Farage consistently tours the country saying that 70% of our laws are made in the EU. It's just not the case. Um, the House of Commons Library um, states that only 7% of our laws are, are affected by what's happening in, in, in Brussels. 
Um, so, you know, I, I think we've got to, got to challenge a lot of those, those facts um, before, you know, we, we seriously think about a, a referendum as well. And now to the gentleman here at the front. Hi, I'd just like to cast some criticisms about Miliband's reduction of fees to £6,000. This reduction won't make a huge amount of difference to students, as we're still paying twice as more as Welsh students. So we're still getting a pretty rubbish deal. Uh, wouldn't it be more effective to reduce it to £3,000 so it's UK, so it's England and Wales paying the same amount? Well, I, I mean, I, I mean it, it will make a difference. I mean, over, over, over three years, obviously £9,000 is a lot of money. Um, I mean, the, the main thing for us, I mean, I think if there had been any further kind of proposed reduction, it would have been more difficult um, to, to bring in the changes straight away. So obviously you guys would have all been affected, or most of you, 90% of you probably would have been affected by the trebling of fees, as I was. And I think part of it was we wanted to ensure that those people that had been hit, wrongfully so, were at least getting something back. So that's why we've said that as a result of, of lowering fees to £6,000, that will allow us to bring the policy in immediately, um, you know, the day we enter government, if, if we do, which I'm sure we will, um, which are obviously, you know, Im impact on all of you. Okay. Um, so we'll have the gentleman here in the white shirt, and then following that, the gentleman there in the hoodie. Um, so given the success of the Portuguese model of decriminalization of all drugs, um, and given the British system's unequivocal failing, What's Labour's, or more specifically your, idea of decriminalisation of all drugs to benefit those who use with a long-run view of introducing legal regulated markets to get rid of the problems caused by a black market? Because it's undeniable that prohibition doesn't I think work. there are elements, there's certainly, I, I agree with you completely, um, there are elements of the current system that, that, that aren't working. I, I think this current system does need reform. I wouldn't go as far as completely decriminalising all drugs use um, because I think that there are a lot of there's a lot of um, that there's a lot of issues there, potential issues there. Um, you know, I, I think part of the thing we've also got to do is shift the emphasis away from deterrence, which, to be honest, aren't aren't working. They're definitely not working, um, and shift the emphasis onto a lot of the reasons kind of behind drugs use, and um, particularly addiction. Um, and, and that's really important as well, and obviously that will, will, will save us money in the long term. It will allow us to be far more effective when tackling drugs use as well. And now over there, um, Mike. Hi. Um, Hi the current top rate of tax is 45%. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you'd be in favour of uh, raising this up to 50%. Um, can you explain why you think uh, Labour was wrong in having this top rate of tax set at 40%? for the majority of its last period in government? Or is this just another political move? No, it's based, we're committed to um, reinstating the 50% tax rate. Um, you know, we have said in, in hindsight that that wasn't necessarily the, the right thing to do at the time. I mean, this is based on the belief that those at the top should also be paying their, their fair share. At the moment, we don't believe this is happening. And this is one of the ways that we, we will ensure that that happens. Okay, um, any other hands up for questions? Um, we still haven't covered a lot of areas of um, immigration at the NHS, so first we've got the gentleman in the check shirt, and then after that at the back, um, with his hand up in the black t-shirt. Hi, uh, you've been quite good at towing the Labour Party line all evening, but is there anything you can offer us that's different to any other part of the Labour Party? I mean, what do you actually stand for that's different? Well, I, I don't want, I'm not going to go out of my way to, to criticise um, policy just for the sake of it. You know. I'm here representing the Labour Party. Um, I represent Labour Party values. They're the values I believe, and those are the values that our policies are formed and founded upon. So that's what I'm, I'm here representing. You know, I, I'm not just kind of trying to kind of pick policies um, to, to criticise. You know, um, j just just for the sake of doing it. Um, but you know, I, I understand what you mean. But you know, I can assure you that it's not the case. We just simply turn the party line. And now back. Uh, um, if a deal in the general election with the Scottish National Party resulted in a Labour-led coalition, would the Labour government be looking to um, have another referendum on Scottish independence and would the English uh, population also be getting a say on this as well? Um, as it stands, 
it, it's, it's slightly irrelevant because we, we are not thinking about any coalition deals, any deals the SNP or any other party. What we're thinking about is a majority government because that's what we believe Britain leads. Um, we, we are on course to achieve that. I think we will achieve that. Um, so, you know, the chances are, I certainly hope, we will not find ourselves in that situation. With, with respect to the specific question of whether um, you would support England having a say in the referendum, did, or did Well, you know? I mean, I'm not, I'm not thinking about that, nor is the Labour Party. What we're thinking about is May and, and getting a majority. I think that that's a question um, for further along the line, even when it occurs. OK, back to the floor. Um, if we've got hands, so we'll have the gentleman here um, in the cream or black, and then down um, over here um, with her hand up. Afterwards. Hello. Um, so oh, yeah. I was wondering. Where are you? He's uh, hello. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't tell the microphone. Was <laughs> flat top. <laughs> so I was wondering what, um, if you can make clear the Labour Party's uh, views and also your own views on uh, the Trident missile defence system. Okay. So um, as it stands, um, we're in, in favour of, um, of 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 a, of a descale but a appropriate um, nuclear deterrent. Um, it, it, it's certainly something that, that we're continuing to, to assess. Um, I, I, whether it would be a, a light flight replacement, I, I, I actually doubt. Um, but you know, we think it's important that we still maintain some kind of, of, of nuclear deterrent, but hopefully not um, a nuclear deterrent that involves the level of cost that Trident involves, often at a time when we, we are continuing to face economic challenges. Okay, and then to the lady up here at the front. What I'd like to know about is Labour's policies on green policies, because I'd, I think that most of the people in this room care about yeah. the environment and would like to know what Labour think on that. Um, and, and rightfully so. Um, I mean, I, I personally believe that the greatest threat um, we face as, as humankind, as a country, as a, a planet, is climate change. It's something I, I don't believe our response to has necessarily been, been, been adequate. I think we, we've got to continue to do more. Having said that, I, I think um, the last Labour government made some fantastic um, strides forward and had some real achievements on, on, on green issues. I mean, I'm sure you'll know about the Kyoto Protocol, um, which at the moment we're, we're in danger of, of missing our, our Kyoto targets. Um, Ed Miliband personally, in fact, was behind um, the Climate Change Act, which was a groundbreaking um, piece of legislation at the time. Um, you know, in Ed Miliband, you would be getting a, a, a green prime minister, which is fantastic. Um, so, not in that sense, but you would be getting a, 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 um, a green Labour prime minister, um, which, is, which is brilliant. Um, so, um, and we are committed to a decarbonisation target of 2030. Um, which uh, I believe is really important. We have to set ourselves um, long-term targets. We want to continue to invest in renewable energy sources because um, that's obviously um, really important as well. Um, we obviously want to um, continue to invest in, in things like cycling infrastructure, get more people out of their cars. I mean, these are, these are part of our... Um, you know, part of our, our transport policies are based around that. We want to expand the existing green investment bank to invest in renewable... Um, renewable technologies um, as well, which will hopefully go a long way in, into um, to, to kind of diversifying our, our energy mix and meeting that 2030 decarbonisation target. Okay. Um, any further questions? So we'll have the gentleman here in the, uh, with the glasses and then over here in the tie after that. What policies do you have to support British farming? Um... <laughs> so obscure question. Um, I, um, I mean, personally, I, I actually uh, I, I um, used to help out on a farm when I was younger. Um, for for, for it, it's an area personally I'm I, I'm passionate about. I think we should be doing all we can. So I mean, at the moment we, we import a lot of our, our milk, for example, um, from from Europe. I think we need to be um, making sure that, that we prioritise British farmers. Um, I think that that's, that's really important, um, you know, making sure that we are sourcing all of our food, all of our produce as locally as possible. I think um, local cities and regions have to take a role in a lead, uh, and a lead in that. I mean, I know farmers over the past, um, over the past few years have had a really raw deal, um, particularly as a result of a lot of the, um, the deals being made with supermarkets as well. So I think 
ultimately, we've, we've got to prioritise British farming um, and, and British produce. Um, and the next question over here. Uh, Ollie, when, when, we, when I first saw you, you were giving a talk just moments after Yon Mi Park, who had just escaped from North Korea. So what I wanted to know is, what is your position would, on international aid and development? Would you increase that or decrease it when everyone's feeling already quite uh, tight for cash at the moment? So. Yeah, I mean, we're com committed to, to certainly maintaining the, the existing targets, the, the targets that were put in place and prioritised um, by the last... Labour government. Um, in fact, the very issue recently went to a vote in the Commons. Uh, I'm really pleased that obviously with, with, um, with, with, with um, Labour and also Liberal Democrat support, we were able to ensure that those targets would be, would be met. That's something we're committed to ensuring um, over the course of the next, uh, the next Labour government. Okay, if we go to our last round of questions, so, so we'll go to the lady over there, um, and then after that, we'll finish up with the guy at the front here. Hiya. Um, you've talked about plans to increase like, spending in the NHS. Yeah. Um, how are you going to pay for it? So our plans for the NHS are funded by a tax on homes worth over £2 million. Um, another example of those at the top um, paying their fair share. Um, we're also going to crack down on tax avoidance as well, that will go a long way to achieving that um, £2.5 billion a year. And we're also going to implement a tax levy on tobacco companies. Because obviously, you've got a situation whereby tobacco companies are selling their cigarettes. It's impacting upon our NHS. It's only fair that they, they contribute um, money um, you know, in, the, in the way of dealing, some of the, dealing with some of the impacts um, of, of, of that. So that's how we're going we're gonna to find the £2.5 Billion pounds, and, and can I just say actually on that point, um, every single one of our, our manifesto um, pledges, every single one of our policies that will appear in our manifesto, um, will be fully funded. We're the only party that's committed um, to having our manifesto audited by independently audited by the budget by the Office for, for Budget Responsibility as well. And at the front, uh, earlier on today, the. Uh, Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Select Committee published a report on um, government surveillance, primarily by GCHQ um, and its American counterpart in the National Security Agency. Um, basically, it cleared the government of any wrongdoing and said that surveillance was not dis disproportionate. Um, so would you be able to clarify the Labour Party's position as a whole and yours on um, surveillance of individual communications? Um, I, I haven't actually seen the report, so in terms of commenting on that, that specifically, I won't be able to do that, but the wider issue of, of, um, of surveillance, um, I, I think it's a really difficult question. I think, um, obviously, we are facing increasing security risks as a result of what's happened in the Middle East with IS. Um, you know, that there, there, there are countless examples. Um, and, and in a way, you know, it's almost, we, we've got to be very careful um, not to, to, to simply pander to terrorism and, and in, a, in a sense, you know, us giving up our, our civil liberties, our, our freedoms is, is an example of, of perhaps doing that and certainly in the eyes of IS, um, they may see that as, 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 an, as an achievement, as, you know, as, 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 as um, in, in the way of us, us giving up those freedoms. Um, but at the same time, we do face security risks, and we do face an increase in security risks. That's something we have to come to terms with. That's something we have to try and tackle. I mean, um, the, the case of, of Lee Rigby, really tragic case a few years ago now. Um, quite recently, though, it's, it's been concluded that actually, um, if there had been you know, further, further regulation, um, we may have been able to, to stop that happening. Um, so, you know, I, I think at the same time, we've got to make sure we're getting the balance right between preventing terrorism but not giving up, you know, our civil liberties, our freedoms that we should be rightfully proud of in the UK. And if we can end with one question from Twitter on a light note, asking how well can Ollie eat a bacon sandwich? <laughs> um, depends how hungry I am. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> right. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. Um, now, we've got a few events to make you all aware of. So, Next Thursday, uh, the Politics Society and the Debating Society are putting on a student general election hustings for you. Um, so this will have students from the university taking part from the Conservatives, Labour, 
Greens, Lib Dems and UKIP, um, and it will be conducted in a similar Q&A format. So this will be taking place in CB 1.12 from 7pm onwards, which is sure to be interesting, so do come along to that. Um, then after that, from 8.15 onwards, we're going to have the prospective Conservative MP for Bath, Ben Howlett, coming along at the latest time, 8.15 in here, to answer your questions. Then, um, later on, um, in, from the uh, 28th of March, which is a Saturday, uh, we've got the Bath and Beyond Political uh, Conference, which has been put on by the Ethical and Political Society. So we've got think tanks coming along, for example, Sir John Jones, who's an expert in education. That's from 11 till 6, and be sure to find the event on Facebook. Um, but I'd think, like to thank you all again for coming, and thank Ollie for taking our questions. Thank you.